main focus of my argument today is the reorganization of democracy, of democratic politics. But before I continue to develop this argument, let me pause and attempt to situate us where we are in the larger plan. A progressive alternative today, I think, should be organized primarily around four main focal points. The democratization of the market order, the deepening of democracy, the organization or self-organization of civil society outside the state and outside the market, and the transformation of education and through education of consciousness. Uh, as you may remember from the early classes, I, I think of each of these domains or the programmatic ideas about them as the marking of a direction, not as a blueprint. The two most important attributes of a programmatic argument are that they define a direction and that they select in a particular historical circumstance the initial steps by which to move in that direction. For the sake of conceptual clarity, which has a premium in this circumstance in which we find ourselves at a move from the struggle for power, I choose to describe most of these alternatives at a point neither very close to what exists now nor very far away, at an intermediate distance, in the hope that this intermediate distance facilitates the conceptual clarification. But I've remarked to you in an early class that in practical politics, in the language of, tra of transformative practice, and the political prophecy, we discard this middle distance because it tends to suggest alternatives that are too close to what exists to arouse enthusiasm, but not close enough to seem entirely feasible. And therefore, in practical politics, we prefer to this middle distance the combination of the very close to the very far away. And thus the discourse of transformative practice and the political prophecy is at once prophetic and practical. The main way in which this argument about alternatives, about a progressive alternative, differs from Marxist theory which after all has been the main intellectual influence on the evolution of the left, is that it rejects the binary idea of politics, the idea that there, there's an indivisible system and that therefore politics must either be the reformist management of one of these indivisible systems or the revolutionary substitution of one indivisible system by another. The emphasis is structural, but nevertheless fragmentary, and proceeds on the premise of divisibility rather than on the assumption of indivisibility. And the main way in which it differs from the progressive ideas of the institutionally conservative social democrats or social liberals who after all represent most of what passes as the left in the contemporary West, is that it is not satisfied with compensatory redistribution. It regards compensatory redistribution as entirely accessory to structural change, although it depicts structural change as fragmentary rather than as systemic. Now, the heart of a progressive program today must be the transformation of the market order. The reorientation of the, 
arrangements that organize the market and create a basis for socially inclusive economic growth. And I have imagined then that there are three main themes today in the organization of such a progressive political economy. The first and perhaps the most important one is the relation of the vanguard of production, the new vanguard, which we call the knowledge economy or the innovation economy, to the rest. The second is the theme of the relation of labor to capital. And the third is the relation of finance to the real economy or to production. And about each of these themes, I've tried to suggest both the direction and the initial steps of a transformation. Now, of course, we must nevertheless have a position with respect to the theme that in fact occupies almost the entirety of conventional progressive discourse, which is redistribution. And I remind you of the three main ideas which I developed when I briefly addressed that subject which I take to be accessory to the main one. There are three ideas which I presented in hierarchical order. The first idea is that the effort to change the structure that defines the primary distribution of advantage and opportunity trumps everything that we can do by way of creating a secondary through corrective redistribution by progressive taxation or by redistributive social spending. The progressive redistribution cannot make up for the defects of the original distribution because we can't allow the market to create a wealth and then as it were, take it all back. If we attempt to take it all back, we will simply destabilize the established economic arrangements and the incentives associated with them to save, invest, and employ. The secondary distribution, the corrective redistribution, can have certain positive effects. Uh, it can reinforce what we attempted to achieve in the original redistribution and most particularly, uh, it can do what European social democracy has done, which is to invest heavily in people and in their capabilities, especially through investment in public education and in public health. Uh, the second idea is that with respect to the budget on both the revenue raising side and the spending side, what matters most, I have argued, is the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is spent. Rather than the progressive profile of taxation on the revenue raising side of the budget. So if we adopt a tax that is on its face regressive, like the flat rate comprehensive value added tax, we there have a fiscal instrument that is neutral with respect to the system of relative prices. And because it is neutral with respect to the system of relative prices, it allows us to maximize the tax take while minimizing the economic disruption or cost of the higher level of taxation. And as the European example has shown us, everything by the, that we lose by way of progressivity on the revenue raising side of the budget, we can then gain in double on the spending side. So in the short term, what matters most is the aggregate level of the tax take and how it's spent. The spending side of the budget rather than the revenue raising side of the budget. The
The main purpose of taxation is to finance the state and not to create a secondary distribution that replaces the primary distribution. We then come to the third principle in this hierarchical enumeration, which is nevertheless, once we have established the tax system on the basis of the taxation of consumption, even if it is the indirect and regressive taxation of consumption, we can add to it a sharply progressive element if we want, if we have the political power and the political will to do so. And I suggested that the two main targets of progressive taxation are first, the accumulation and exercise of economic power, and second, the hierarchy of standards of living. The accumulation of economic power is hard to reach through taxation. The most effective way you reach it is at the moment of death through a confiscatory tax on the hereditary transmission of wealth or its anticipated form as gifts inter vivos in the family. The other main target is the hierarchy of standards of living, and that we can reach directly by a fiscal instrument that is much more effective than the income tax. The fiscal instrument is an individualized tax on consumption, which historically we call the Caldor tax, named after Nicholas Caldor, which taxes the difference between the aggregate income of the individual, the return to labor and the return to capital, and invested saving. And this difference between what the individual earns by way of return to his labor or return to his capital and his invested saving is what he spends on himself and invests in his standard of living. He spends on his standard of living. And that rate can be as sharp as we want. The sky is the limit. The only limit is political power and political will. The highest rate of the individualized consumption tax can be a multiple of 100%. It doesn't have to be 100%. These three ideas about the role of compensatory redistribution give a role, give a place to compensatory redistribution, but of course subordinated entirely according to the first idea to structural change. We can see how distant the contemporary progressives are from this horizon by simply looking around us and seeing that no state in the contemporary world uh, follows this program that I've just described to you. Uh, now, before I go any further, let me stop and ask whether someone would like to make a comment or ask a question about these ideas. Now, you can, we can ask, uh, now at the end of this discussion of progressive political economy. What general conditions in social life make it more or less likely that we will be able to satisfy the requirements that I argued of the first focal point, the creation of a knowledge economy for the many? Of these themes, the most important is to turn the knowledge economy for the few into a knowledge economy for the many. The insular and exclusive vanguard that we have into an inclusive vanguardism that passes through the whole system of production. And that depends, I argue, on three sets of requirements. One is, and the most important, the institutional and legal change of the market order, the transformation of its legal and institutional architecture 
I described three stages of that legal and institutional evolution. One in which we attempt to expand access to productive resources and opportunities in favor of a much larger range of economic agents, primarily the small and medium-sized firms of the backward economy and the multitude of individualized economic agents who have no stable connection to any business organization and whom we try to turn into technologically equipped artisans. Then a second stage in which we begin to develop an alternative architecture of the market order in the vertical relation between the government and the producers, a form of strategic partnership that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. And in the horizontal relations among producers to foment regimes of cooperative competition. And then we come to the third stage, far into the future, in which we imagine that the productive resources of society are vested in a range of independently administered funds, administered under the watch of the democratic institutions, and that these funds auction off the capital and resources of society to their most effective users. And that system could be described as a capitalism without capitalism. The second requirement for this transformation of the knowledge economy of the few into a knowledge economy for the many is a radical change in the character of education. And I describe what kind of education, both general and technical, is necessary to an inclusive knowledge economy. And we'll come back to that theme later in the course. And the third transformation is the accumulation of social capital to make more dense the associative connections within society and thus to lay the basis for the moral transformation on which an inclusive knowledge economy depends because it is a high trust form of production and cooperation rather than the generalization of low trust among strangers, which is what we have in conventional industry and in the inherited form of the market order. So what are the conditions that make it more plausible that a society could satisfy these three sets of requirements, the legal institutional, the educational or cognitive, and the moral or social. And I think that the two main sets of requirements have to do with the radicalization of an experimentalist impulse in every department of social experience and of culture, and with the creation of a high energy democratic politics the main subject of today's class. Now, with respect to the first theme of the radicalization of an experimentalist impulse, uh, I can once again describe it in a very general terms. Conventional, our conventional experience of society is that there is a categorical division, a contrast between two sets of moves. There are the ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted. And there are the extraordinary moves by which, typically under the provocation of crisis, whether social or existential, we challenge and change pieces of this framework. The general direction of what I'm calling experimentalism is that the distance between these two sets of moves diminishes so that the transformation of the framework, the second class of moves, arises more continuously or organically out of the moves that we make within the framework. And that 
that we could say it's one definition of freedom, of emancipation. One, one, one of the meanings of freedom is that freedom is the ability to engage in a social world without surrendering to it. To be free, we have to be able to engage. No one is free, disengaged or isolated. But it cannot be that the price of our engagement be our surrender to this world. We have to deny the last word to the social world and keep it for ourselves. And thus, in a sense, to be at the same time insiders and outsiders. Now, this is not just a moral task for the individual. This is an institutional task, according to my argument for society to create those economic and political institutions that allow them to engage in them without surrendering to them. And as I just said, to keep the last word for ourselves. And they cannot be just economic institutions, although the day-to-day -day reality of the economic arrangements will be an important influence on this experience, they must also be the political institutions and the form of education and of consciousness that prevails in the society. Now that's what I wanted to say before going on to the great theme of democratic politics. And let me again stop and ask whether you have some comment or question about these ideas. Democracy, yes. Can you speak a little louder, please? There's some echo in the room. Uh, this traditional uh, knowledge economy that yes. characterize the knowledge economy is by its relation to mass production on the one hand, mass production is conventional industry, and to craft production on the other hand. So craft production is destandardized, and, but doesn't have scale. Mass production has scale, but doesn't have the potential for destandardization. And I observed that in Europe, the regions where the knowledge economy has flourished most have in general been those regions that had a tradition of pre-Fordist craft production. So pre-Fordism turns out to be useful to sustain post-Fordism. Pre-Fordism is craft Post-Fordism is destandardized, experimentalist, innovative production, the contemporary knowledge economy. So that's, as it were, a suggestion or a key to begin answering your question. The general 
uh, animus or attitude and sustaining these ideas, these arguments, includes antipathy to the idea of a rigid evolutionary framework. So it's not the case that every society has to go through the same evolutionary stages of earlier economic history in order to get to the most recent stage. That seems to me to be the essence of the question that you're asking. So I don't know about Nepal, but I think, for example, in my own country of Brazil, how this problem presents itself to us. We had in the southeast of the country, especially in Sao Paulo, a characteristic form of import substituting industrialization and um, the old vanguard, the vanguard of conventional Fordist industry, large scale production of standardized goods and services, rigid machines and production processes, semi skilled labor, very hierarchical and specialized relation to production. And now it's being rapidly de industrialized. Brazil is rapidly deindustrializing, one of the countries in the world that is destroying its inherited industrial base most quickly. And agriculture, ranching, and mining are paying the bill of urban consumption and allowing us to disguise our, our, our failure, uh, the collapse of our most our, our earlier vanguard. Now, so then we ask ourselves, does every part of the country have to become first the Sao Paulo of the middle of the 20th century in order later to become something else? That's the debate. And it's a, ver it's a version of the question you just asked. And the general disposition is to say no. Of course, this most advanced form of production depends on a series of presuppositions. It depends on a very kind, particular kind of education, for example. And it depends on the, on the use of the powers of the state to lift up that, that periphery, uh, to give it access not just to capital or credit, but to advanced practice to reinvent technology so that the technology can be assimilated according to the potential, the capacity of assimilation of those ec economic agents at that time. So it's not an easy operation, but that's the kind of operation that's involved. And I think it's incompatible with the idea that there's a fixed evolutionary sequence and that the, the poorer or more primitive societies have to go through the same stages in order to get to the most advanced stage, which would be in the spirit of Marxism. And of course, one of the questions that, that, that's most important practically is whether the state has the instruments, the institutional instruments necessary for this lift up project. So in the contemporary world, some states have those instruments and some don't. Do they have organizations that can orient the backward small and medium-sized firms? Do they have networks of vocational schools that can then take on this advanced educational conception? Do they have development banks that can provide the necessary credit and so forth. So there is a prior stage of acquiring these instruments, but it's possible for something, it's possible for there to happen what happens in Brazil, which is we have the instruments and we nevertheless, we don't have the project. It's more common in the world that there not be the instruments and that the commitment to the project then animates the struggle to create the instruments. But you can have the instruments and nevertheless fail to have the project. So I think it's an idea about national development, uh, which is based on this, on this notion of empowerment. Uh, and 
is less likely to take hold when the dominant idea of the society is co-option. It's the part of the moral basis of this idea is the notion of the individual producer and citizen being treated as an agent to empower rather than as a beneficiary to co-op. Now we come to the discussion of democracy and democratic politics. And I want to begin with a claim that all of the democracies that exist in the world are relatively weak democracies or low energy democracies by a triple standard, which is the following. First, in the, in the sense of facilitating the repeated practice of fragmentary structural change, which is the only kind of structural change that really exists. Second, by diminishing the dependence of such change on crisis, weakening the extent to which trauma in the form of economic collapse or war is the enabling circumstance of change, and therefore by the criterion of overthrowing the rule of the living by the dead. Because the unavailability of structural change or the dependence of change on crisis means that the dead rule the living. Now, before I describe the institutional changes that are implicit in the program of creating a high-energy democracy, uh, let me first uh, define the position of this program in relation of two major controversies in the history of modern politics and in the history of political thought. The first conflict has to do with conception or ideology, and the second conflict has to do with institutional arrangements. So starting with the conflict about ideology, the most influential ideological contrast in the history of modern political theory was the contrast proposed by the Franco-Swiss political theorist Benjamin Bourdin at the beginning of the 19th century. It was the contrast between what Constant called the liberty, the freedom of the ancients and the freedom of the moderns. So the freedom of the ancients was the expression of their experience of a form of life in which politics was central. Politics occupied the central space and animated all of existence or experience. And this was then projected into a mythical picture of ancient Rome or ancient Sparta, a form of life in which the political is central opposed to the freedom of the moderns, the freedom of the moderns are the individual who lives in a real modern society, flesh and bones, incarnated, preoccupied with particular interests, his private interests, and for that individual, politics is always ecstatic. It's an anomaly, it's an exception to the normal tenor of his life. His life is dominated by particular interests, by private interests. And many of the theorists of the transformation of democracy in the modern world, for example, someone like Hannah Arendt, have been obsessed with this counter image of the freedom of what Benjamin Constant called the freedom of the ancients. But the freedom of the ancients is not for real. The real Rome or real Sparta were not like 
what Benjamin Constant described. There never was a society in which the individual was first a citizen and only then everything else. He was always everything else first before he was a citizen. And so the only point of departure that we can take, I want to argue, to avoid bad utopianism, which is simply to imagine an idealized transformation, which is just the reversal of our experience. The only way in which we can do that is to take the freedom of the modern as the point of departure. To say that it is the point of departure is not to say that it's the point of arrival. That's the fundamental difference. We start with this individual for whom politics is ecstatic, anomalous, exceptional. A deviation from the normal tenor of life. And we want to change this individual little by little to increase his sympathies, his attachments, the scope of his attention and of his activity. And it goes back to the contrast that I drew a minute ago between these two categories of moves. The ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted, and the exceptional moves by which we challenge and change pieces of that framework. So Benjamin Constant's freedom of the moderns is a description of a world in which those two moves are radically contrasted. And there's no bridge, no easy bridge from one to another, except when there is crisis in the form of ruin or of war. And what we want, then, is to relativize to weaken the contrast between these two sets of moves and to create a world in which the struggle about the framework emerges in little pieces, naturally, continuously, organically, out of the moves that we make within the framework. Now, the second contrast, I said, is the contrast about institutions. So it is extraordinary how narrow the repertoire of established constitutional arrangements for the organization of the state in a democracy is. There's a very tiny list of live constitutional options. The American-style parliamentary regime, the pure presidential regime, the pure parliamentary regimes is in the English system, and then the hybrid continental European forms which were created in the 20th century. And the only tangible alternative to that very narrow repertory of constitutional arrangements has been the idea of the revolutionary left, of a government based on direct popular participation in the interlude of revolution, the government of popular council. Soviets, with the idea that representative institutions identified with that narrow, rigid repertory should be resisted and replaced by direct democracy. And we know what that has been in actual historical experience. The idea of direct democracy has always just been a feint or an interlude it has become real only in this brief moment of insurrection and has cast aside. You could say it's a version of political romanticism in the following sense. The essence of the romantic idea is that there's an insoluble antinomy, a contradiction between spirit and structure. So structure is the hand of Midas killing spirit. Romantic love, by contrast to the routines of married life, or 
the mob in the streets at the moment of revolution by contrast the monotonous bureaucratic routines in the normal periods of the administration of the state. Romanticism is, among other things, a form of despair. It is a form of despair about the possibility of changing the relation between spirit and structure and creating structures which are hospitable to spirit because they allow or favor their own transformation. So I'm going back to the example of the romantic novel. So in the romantic novel, the object, the aim is for the hero, the protagonist of the romantic novel, to conquer the hand of the beloved. But And then at the end of the novel, the marriage is achieved. But in the romantic novel, the, not, the marriage is never described, even though it was the goal of the whole exercise. So the actual experience of the routines of married life is unimaginable for the romantic uh, because he has no conception of how this idea, instead of just floating above our ordinary experience, can penetrate, can become imminent in our life. So it seems to me that that's what's involved in this notion of the supersession of representative institutions by the interlude of direct democracy. The romantic thinks the only time when we're really free, when we're fully alive, is in this interlude in which we shake the rule of routine, of repetition, of structure. That's when we're alive momentarily. The structures the romantic understands will always come back. They'll, and that's why it's just like a hand of Midas killing his spirit. But for a moment, we will have lived as, as the gods lived. Huh? We will have participated in the infinity of God. That's the idea. Opposed to the conception that if there's a, a higher a spiritual form, a higher form of life, that form of life must live not just as a dream or as an interlude, but it must come down into the earth and penetrate routine life. Kierkegaard, philosopher, said, the struggle against routine is a struggle against life, because life is penetrated by routine, and what's essential is this dialectic between routine and spirit, and not simply the notion that we flee from structure into spirit, and spirit is then just the antagonist of structure, rather than taking a structural So there's a very narrow repertory of constitutional arrangements in the world. Uh, most countries in the world are always creating new constitutions, discarding the advice of Napoleon Bonaparte, who said that a constitution should be brief and obscure. Uh, and the only nation that has followed his advice seems to be the United States, uh, where the tradition is to change the Constitution by pretending that it means something different. Uh, the notion that you can change the Constitution that way has a bias that the Americans are not entirely aware of. It has a bias in favor of reinterpretation of rights and against reorganization of structure. So it's easy to pretend that equal protection or due process means one thing rather than another thing. But it's very hard to pretend that the Constitution says that there should be five branches of government when it seems to say that there are three branches of government. And that's the bias, which in the United States is exported from the interpretation of the Constitution 
to the understanding of all of all of law is penetrated by the same idea, the idealization of the system of rights. So it's a very narrow repertory. In the 20th century, the European democracies added to the pre-existing choice between parliamentary sovereignty and American-style presidential regime, what you could call, they added two things. The first thing is they added what you could call dualism. That is the idea that there would be both a directly elected president and a government responsible to parliament. So there would be two foundations for sovereignty in the state. And there would be more flexibility, more responsiveness to the electorate, supposedly and a flexibility that would avoid political instability and allow for greater adaptation to changing constitutional circumstances. That was the first very modest constitutional innovation. The second innovation was more consequential. It was to begin to fill the constitutions with promises of rights unkept promises. So this is the most saving characteristic of the 20th century constitutions. You open them and they have 300 articles promising the sky, education, health, jobs, everything. Everything you can imagine is in the constitution as a constitutional right, bereft of any institutional machinery that would keep those promises. That was the direction that they found. This is what you might call Weimarism, because the, the Weimar Constitution after the First World War was the first one that took this direction, later widely imitated throughout the whole world. So once again, with respect to the second contrast, contrast between the inner circle and the outer circle, we have to begin with the inner circle because it's the only one that's real. The other one is a gesture, huh? a hope of escape, bad utopianism. But once again, also, to say that it's the point of departure is not to say that it's the point of arrival. We start with this very narrow repertory of real constitutional arrangements, the arrangements of representative democracy, and we want to expand it. And that's then the project, the program of this argument that I now want to begin. Now, should I then launch into my argument, or do you have a, a, a question, given the starting point, given these premises? So there are five sets of institutional arrangements that would compose the institutional content or character of what I'm calling high energy democracy. The first set of constitutional innovations has to do with the heightening of the temperature of politics. By the temperature of politics, I mean the level of organized popular engagement in political life, also called by the political scientists, political mobilization. The premise of conservative political science and conservative statecraft is that there is an unavoidable choice between a politics that is cold and institutional and a politics that is hot an anti-institutional or extra-institutional. In other words, at the end of the day, we have to choose between Madison and Mussolini. That's the premise of, that's the premise of conservative political science and conservative statecraft. It's also formulated as 
political scientists like Campbell Huntington formulated it in the idea that there's a, a fixed relation and, and opposition between political mobilization and political institutionalization. So political mobilization and political institutionalization above a certain threshold are opposites. They work against each other. And a heightened degree of mobilization undermines the institutions. That's another way of saying there's a choice between the cold and institutional or the hot and anti or extra institutional. So the anti-institutional can also be labeled Caesarism. When the, the popular demagogues arouse the mass against the institutions. Now, what is the substantive core of the problem here? The problem is the denial of a possibility. The denial of the possibility that there can be political institutions that create a democracy that is both hot and institutional. That's the question. And what are these institutions? How do we raise the temperature of politics without undermining the institutions? And the thesis is that we don't do so by some sudden dramatic gesture. We do so by the cumulative and combined effects of arrangements that are familiar. So let me in the list what some of these arrangements are that tend to elevate the temperature of politics without undermining its institutional character. So first there's the vote. And the elementary question whether the vote is optional or mandatory. So in the United States, half of the electorate votes in the national election. In many countries in the world, both rich and poor, the vote is mandatory. And what does it mean to have a system of mandatory voting? It simply means that there's a, a requirement, a legal requirement to vote with the under a sanction of a small fine with the privilege of abstention. And of course, under a system of mandatory voting, Abstention has a very different significance from what it has under a system of optional voting. Because under a system of optional voting, abstention can mean simply, I'm not bothered by the situation of the country, uh, so I don't really care what happens. Everything is going all right. Under a system of mandatory voting, massive abstention is a demoralization of the system. The citizens reject the options that are presented to them. So for example, when the Peronist candidate was excluded from the elections in Argentina, and there were the number of abstentions was greater than the number of votes for the candidate who supposedly won, the system was demoralized. The candidate was discredited, it has a completely different meaning. Then there are the electoral regimes, the effects of which are entirely circumstantial. So for example, what is more mobilizing or what raises the temperature? Is it first, is it majoritarian first past the post voting, or is it proportional representation? So, in a system like, say, the Italian party system, in which there are rigidified, fossilized party system, first past the post voting can be disruptive when initially introduced and therefore mobilized. Whereas in many other societies, or presumably most democracies, it's the opposite. Proportional representation is disruptive. But this is not an inherent property of these electorate regimes. It depends on the relation between the electoral regime and the society. Now then take the question of money in politics. So 
constrain on the use of private money. In the United States, the idea is that uh, the right privately to finance politics is a form of free expression. The Supreme Court in the United States said, money talks. A colleague of mine, Paul Freud, said, commenting on this, he said, I thought that was the problem. Uh, so, uh, should the, is, there, is there a relation, what's the relation between money and politics? Another is the relation between politics and the means of mass communication. So for politics to take this mobilizing direction, space in the means of mass communication must not be something that can be bought. It must be allocated for free to the political parties or to the organized social movements as a condition of the revocable licenses under which the media companies do their business. So, the heightening of the temperature, which is the solution to this false dilemma, having to choose between Madison and Mussolini, on this view, arises as the co combined and convergent result of these many choices. So if you tell me uh, the American people are depoliticized, I said, give me a rule of, a rule of mandatory voting. Give me public financing of political activity and constraints on the use of private money. Give me a prohibition of the sale of television time. Give me innovation in the electoral regimes and I'll show you that they're just as politicized as everyone else. So it turns what seems to be an impossible ideological dilemma into a practical question. Now, there's an issue of sequence. So in the United States, as in many countries, the reformers generally think this is where you should begin. You should begin in reforms that have to do with the relation between money and politics. Those are the first constitutional innovations. They have a causal priority over the others. I think they're mistaken because these innovations are very controversial. There are legal obstacles or constitutional obstacles to them as well as ideological obstacles. So I think that the, the best place to begin is the reinvention of American federalism. But that's an example of a, of a, of a strategic problem in the development of the program of, of the innovations leading to a high energy democracy. The general predisposition of the progressives around the world with respect to constitutional change is to think the reform of politics comes first. It's not just that in politics the reform of the use of money comes first, but in the larger program of transformation the reform of politics comes first in relation to everything else. I think this is totally, completely false. No country in history reforms its politics in order later to decide what to do with the reform politics. The reformation of the state and the politics only happens when it needs to happen. And it's subsequent, it's a corollary of a struggle over the redirection of the social and economic path. So, so the reorientation of political economy must come first, and then it then provokes this struggle over the nature of politics. Politics is for something. No one would, no one would embark on this task of changing the fundamental character of democratic politics and say to himself, then later we'll decide what to do with it. That's not how it happens. So that's the first set of innovations about the temperature of politics. And 
the, the intended outcome is a high temperature policy that is high temperature but institutional. Based on constitutional arrangements and tending toward the political organization of the people. The second set of constitutional innovations has to do with the pace of politics. So remember Karl Popper and the philosophy of science. The point in science is to make mistakes as quickly as possible. The point in democratic politics is also to make mistakes as quickly as possible. It's acceleration. And it's the rapid resolution of impasse. Now, and this, let's, let me illustrate this with this, the clearest example, which is the American constitutional arrangements widely imitated in South and Central America. In the architecture of the American constitutional arrangements, there are two principles. There is a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power. There are many sources of power or agents of power in the state. And there is a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics, so which is represented or embodied in Madison's scheme of checks and balances. The Americans think mistakenly that these two principles, the liberal principle and the conservative principle are naturally and necessarily connected. They're wrong. They aren't naturally and necessarily connected. They're connected by intention or design. It was part of Madison's objective to inhibit the transformative uses of politics and especially to prevent the use of politics to transform the economic regime in the United States. Uh, So the, the consequence of this combination of the liberal principle with the conservative principle is to establish a kind of table of correspondences between the transformative reach of any political project and the severity of the constitutional obstacles that it has to overcome in order to be implemented. That's the practical effect. So, the more transformative with respect to the structure of society, the greater the obstacles. So Franklin Roosevelt of the United States had as his allies the greatest war in all human history up to that point, and the greatest depression in modern history. And even then he had trouble because the Constitution was designed to give him trouble. Uh, so let's take the American example of, what, of which constitutional innovations could result in the rapid resolution of impasse. Suppose there is an impasse between the two political branches, the president and the Congress. One way of solving this problem is to say either branch, either one of the two political branches should enjoy the constitutional prerogative of being able to overcome the impasse by call, calling early elections. So long as the branch that unilaterally exercises the prerogative of calling the early election must also pay the political price of running the electoral risk. In other words, the prerogative of calling the early election would be unilateral, but the election should always be bilateral for both branches. So that the branch that called the early elections would have to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. Now, one might think that this system would, would result in elections that were too frequent, but I think that it's much more likely to have the opposite problem of being a prerogative that would rarely be invoked. And the reason is very simple, that the politicians don't want to lose their seats and don't want to subject themselves to this electoral risk unless there is an overwhelming popular mandate for what they propose. 
So by, and this example that I'm giving of constitutional innovation in the American uh, regime illustrates another point about institutional design, which is that with respect to institutional design, small changes can have drastic consequences. So this is a relatively modest change. You could compare it to the, in, in the following respect, to the constitutional arrangements of the French Fifth Republic. You know that in the Fifth Republic in France, there are two constitutional times. There's a fast time, which is when the parliamentary majority converges with the president. And there's a small, slow time, which the French call cohabitation, when the parliamentary majority diverges from the president. The system that I've just described is a system in which there's only fast time. There's no slow time. Or there's no time that needs to be slow because it's a device for changing slow time into fast time, which is, after all, our objective here. So that's the solution. Uh, and I think that's very interesting because, as I say, it shows something about institutional innovation, that relatively discreet and relatively modest institutional innovation can have dramatic effects. You don't have to design a whole new constitutional order. That's with respect then to the, the, the second theme. You don't have to choose between politics that is cold and institutional and politics that's hot and anti-institutional. And you don't have to connect the liberal principle of fragmentation of power with the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. Any comment about the second innovation? Yes. Will, will this not benefit authoritarian governments in France? Would what? Will it not benefit authoritarian or populist governments in France? Yeah, in what way you mean because if the president had a large popular following, he could use this to overcome the stalemate. Yes, he could. But is that something we want to avoid? I mean, uh, so. The American presidential regime was imitated in Latin America, right? And in, Latin, in the Latin American republics, it had a paradoxical effect in many of the societies because it allows for the election of an outsider. Uh, so in Brazil, forever, the elites are trying to suppress the American presidential regime because every four years, it's a nightmare. There's a, that some outsider can win power and disrupt everything, right? We, and that's what they don't want. So they say, a parliamentary regime will be able to share power among us, the professional politicians, the party machines, and so forth. That's what they want. The Brazilian people have, on every occasion, in all the plebiscites, rejected this plan because of their correct intuition that it is a plot to confiscate popular sovereignty. Uh, and they don't, they don't want that. Uh, so then, but then, so this then is the paradox of the regime. If you transport Madison's scheme to societies that are much more unequal and fluid as in Latin America, you, you create a situation in which the leader can be elected president, promising the sky to the masses, right? And he arrives in power, and he discovers that he can't do anything. Uh, uh, his hands are tied. He has enormous power to promote interests or to punish interests, to favor his friends, to attack his enemies. But power to transform, he doesn't have. Uh, 
because the presidential regime was designed to block this power. So the solution is not then to promote blockade, stalemate. Uh, the solution is to resolve stalemate and to create other counterweights to this central power, the organization of the people, uh, the proliferation of political parties, um, the, the alternative sources and powers in the state, many sources of power contending against each other, provided that there is some set of constitutional principles to resolve impasse when it occurs. But that's the choice that would be made. As we don't deal with the accumulation of power by saying, you can't do it. You, you can't take society down a certain direction. We'll stop you from doing that. You can't take it down a certain direction. You'll be subject to many forms of contrast, judicial, political, many powers in the state and many powers in society. But we won't do it by attempting to perpetuate impasse. That's the constitutional choice which is presented in the second set of innovations. That's what's at stake. Now, the third, the third set of innovations has to do with the relation between central power and local power. It's the problem of it's presented to us as the problem of federalism. Although, as I want to say, it doesn't occur just in federations. So here's the general idea which, which animates this third set of innovations. The general idea is this. As society goes down a certain road, it chooses an option. Like one of these leaders says, here's what I propose to the people, and the people support him. Uh, it hedges its bets by allowing parts of itself to deviate from the predominant solutions in the country and generate a counter model of the national future. That's the point. Uh, so, because a counter model is only really effective if it's embodied in something practical, if it's not just a doctrine or an abstraction, it has to be exemplified. And that's then this idea that you would have a dialectic of alternatives in the country. Now, you can imagine that this goes through two stages. Uh, the first stage, the emphasis is on cooperative federalism. So you know, the discourse of federalism in the United States is experimentalist, officially. In the Federalist Papers, the states are described as laboratories of experimentation. But the whole nature of conventional federalism is anti-experimentalist because of the rigid allocation of powers among the different levels of the federation. Experimentalism requires cooperation. And cooperation can be vertical among the three levels of the federation, central, state, and municipal, or it can be horizontal among the municipalities and among the state. Cooperative federalism is an enormous instrument of experimentation. So for example, take, take the take educational problem, which I briefly alluded to in the earlier class. In a country that is large, federal in structure and very unequal. You want to have local management of the schools by the states and municipalities. You don't want to have a, a uniform system that's blind to the, the differences within the country. But you want to insist on the principle that the quality of the education that a young person receives should not depend on the happenstance of where it is born. So in order to reconcile national standards with local management, you need three instruments. So first you need a, a way of testing, school by school and student by student, to see what works. Second, you need a redistributive mechanism 
to redistribute resources and staff from richer places to poor places in the Federation. And third, you need a corrective mechanism to take over a local failing school system if it, despite all efforts, it repeatedly or persistently falls beneath the minimum acceptable level of investment in co or quality, to take it over, to delegate its fixing to independent experts, and to return it fixed once it's fixed. Uh, and this shouldn't be by a federal intervention it should be by some mechanism that associates central and local government in trans-federal collegiate bodies who would be responsible for this selective fixing, which is the equivalent to the restructuring of a failing business in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States. But in every area, federal cooperation co co is central. So, for, so if we need to have, to have, we can only have a national development strategy if this development strategy is translated into different strategies for the regions of the country. And so that then requires the governors of the regions to organize themselves in these regional organizations these interfederal syndicates, as we now call them, uh, which are the basis then of a regional development strategy. And the regional development strategy is the concrete form that the national strategy has to take in order to become practical. So that's the first stage of this experimental idea, cooperation cooperation, both vertical and horizontal. The second stage is what you could call wide divergence. By wide divergence, I mean the following. If you have the presumption that all parts of the country must enjoy simultaneously the same right of divergence, the divergence will necessarily be very limited. So what, what I mean by wide divergence under particular conditions, part of the country can apply for a right, for a right of diverging ex exceptionally far, very far. And of course, we know, for example, from American history, that this, that the exercise of this right of divergence can be an instrument of abuse and oppression, racial and class. So it has to be vetted twice, politically, by the political branches of government and judicially by the judges. So that it not be an instrument of oppression or discrimination of any kind. But if it is vetted, it's then a very powerful instrument for, for this experimental divergence that I described. Now, this reveals something very interesting about the relation between federations and unitary states, which is, that in principle it seems that a federation is the best device for experim experimentation. But unitary states like France or the United Kingdom have an advantage over federations in this wide divergence. Because in a unitary state there is no natural presumption that all parts of the country must have at the same time the same right of divergence. So for example, the government of the United Kingdom can make a deal with Scotland different from the deal it has with Wales, or for that matter, with England. And that's much more readily feasible in a unitary state than it would be in a federation. And it serves the same purpose of promoting what I'm calling wide divergence. I would think we could apply this in the European Union also. Uh, any comment about this? 
So as I be, as I go through the stages of this narrative, I, I I think you get the picture of what I'm trying to establish. That this idea of a high energy democracy is not some mirage. Uh, it results from a combination of very practical, localized initiatives that have this convergent outcome uh, in which little by little we change the character of politics. We don't have to make this big jump into the abyss of participatory, participatory democracy, abolishing representative institutions. We can do something in the accessible which changes the character of political life little by little. Now, the fourth set of innovations then has to do with a, the execution of a task, which is change, structural change that is directed not to all of the citizens or all parts of the country, but to a particular group of people. Suppose there is in the society a group part of a class or of a race that is caught in a circumstance of disadvantage and exclusion, of subjugation, from which they are unable to escape by the forms of collective political and economic action that are available to them. So the idea is there should be in the state a branch, a power, that is able to come to the rescue of this disadvantaged group and release it from its circumstance of subjugation. So in other words, a form of intervention that is structural because it's trying to reorganize some part of social life. But it's localized. It's not a general change of the regime, a general change of the law. It's focused on a particular organization or particular area of social practice. Now this may seem very vague, but in the United States it had a particular practical expression. It goes under the name of the Structural Injunctions or Complex Enforcement, developed by the federal judges, the progressive federal judges, in the closing decades of the 20th century. So the premise was the following, the law, on the, the dominant view of law now is it's a kind of principiology. So each branch of law is viewed as informed by a set of policies and principles. So they impute a high level of ambition to the law. And then these policies and principles were thought to be in contradiction with the subjugating character of certain particular institutions, like the prison systems, or the mental hospitals, or the school systems. And the federal judges then invented a new form of adjudication in which the agents, the participants, were not individuals. They were classes or groups. The evil to be redressed was not the transgression of a right. It was some contradiction between the practices in a particular organization and an ideal imputed to the law. Typically, in the American experience, an anti-subjugation ideal. And the remedy was to invade part of the causal background of social life to change the practices that resulted in the evil by reshaping the, the, light, the organization of the prison or the school system or the mental hospital. So no power in the contemporary state is designed, equipped, financed, and staffed to do this work that is structural but localized. Because structural is supposed to be legislation. That's the Congress, the Parliament. The bureaucrats are supposed to deal with particular evils. 
but there's no branch of government designed, financed, and legitimated to do work that is structural but localized. So the federal judges, the progressive federal judges then in the United States did this work, they took over this work. Why did they do it? Because they wanted to. There are, so there are two principles about the relation of this work to institutional propriety. One principle said, if the law gives you a substantive mandate, implement that mandate, whether or not there is an appropriate institutional agent to do it. The opposing principle was, if the law gives you a substantive mandate, implement the mandate only if there is an appropriate institutional agent. What the judges did de facto was to arbitrarily split the differences, the difference between these two principles. They didn't regard themselves as limited by the absence of an appropriate institutional agent, but they didn't regard the absence of an institutional agent as entirely irrelevant. So they did it until they ran out of power. So they focused on relatively peripheral social organizations like mental hospitals or prisons. Why didn't they keep going? Until, for example, they got to the banks. They, they didn't keep going because, of course, they wouldn't be allowed to keep going. So that's what I mean by they did it until they ran out of power. So what would you want in principle? You would want to create a new power in the state. And could be a new branch of government, if there are branches of government, or at least a new power elected by the people or co-elected by the political branches to do this work, which is structural but localized, and is a way of addressing the problem of the coexistence of democracy with class society. So those promises of rights of the Weimar constitutions were a fake way of addressing the contradiction between democracy and class society. This would be a real way to say, you have a structural obstacle, address the structural obstacle in practice. Create a branch of government that is explicitly designed, legitimate, and financed to do, in the name of the law, a work that is structural but localized. contrast between representative and direct democracy. Instead of replacing representative democracy with direct democracy, you can gradually superimpose on representative democracy some of the characteristics of direct democracy. And you can do it in two directions, from the bottom up or from the top down. From the bottom up, you can have uh, a structure of neighborhood associations, for example, parallel to local government. You can have things like participatory budgeting, direct participations of the citizens in their local government. And from the top down, comprehensive programmatic plebiscites, for example. They're not single issue plebiscites, they're about choices of direction in the country, and which little by little add to representative democracy some of the traits or ambitions of, of, of direct democracy without abolishing representative institutions. So if you now look back at these five sets of innovations, the ones that elevate the temperature, the ones that accelerate the pace, the ones that enhance the dialectic, the interplay between strong central initiative and local divergence, the ones that create a power to uh, rescue 
groups that are caught in circumstances of exclusion or disadvantage from which they are unable to escape and do that by change that is structural but local. And finally, adding little by little to the character representative institutions an element of direct or participatory democracy. The convergent result is to turn the, the weak, low energy democracies into strong, high energy democracies to diminish the dependence of change on crisis and to overthrow the rule of the dead, of the living by the dead. So I think the, my impression is that the character of this discourse appears, quote, utopian only in the large, but not in the small. Because if you look at it as separate pieces, they're all made up of changes that are underway. They are the object of contemporary experience, contemporary debate. It's only the putting of them together into this larger ambition that seems to be over the top. So let me stop, because I've said quite a lot. And of course, what the general character of my argument is, is that relating now the prior discourse about progressive political economy with this discourse about high energy democracy. In the initial stages, the progressive political economy doesn't require political change. But in its later stages, in its more ambitious forms, it does. So the idea is there's conflict over the direction of the market order. That conflict in turn justifies this engagement about the reformation of policy on the principle that conflict over political economy comes first and conflict over politics comes second. Uh, and then we have the conflict over democracy ushered in or necessitated by the struggle over the direction of the transformation of the market order. And that's the general idea. And now you can ask, who is the beneficiary? This is the final element which I would add to this. What's the constituency? So the Marxist notion and the notion that has prevailing for the left is the constituency is the industrial proletariat, which is then the protagonist of conventional industry. But all over the world, the industrial proletariat is a shrinking minority and a relatively privileged one at that, what the Marxists call a labor aristocracy in effect, which is perceived by the other groups in society and ultimately comes to perceive itself as a special interest group rather than as the bearer of the universal interests of humanity. So, who is the majority? And that's where I want to say the majority now in the world is composed by men and women who are poor and for the most part disorganized, but whose horizon of aspiration, rather than being proletarian, is petty bourgeois. So what do they want? They're, they're not members of a small business class. They're not petty bourgeois, objectively but they're petty bourgeois subjective. So what they want is a small farm, a store, a little business, uh, a technical service that they can provide for a fee. Their whole mental horizon is turned to archaic, isolated family business. typically dependent on family saving and self-exploitation. And this has associated spiritually in religion with materialism, individualism, consumerism. It 
doesn't open a direction to any dynamic of productivity. So it's not a base for a growth miracle in the society. No society could ascend to the first level in the world economy simply on the basis of fulfilling this petty bourgeois dream because this petty bourgeois dream literally on its terms is a retrograde dream. It's archaic. It's backward. So what then is the solution to this problem of the mismatch between the agent who exists on the ground and the project? And so there's a missing, uh, there's a missing agent in my story just now. So the missing agent is that in the elites, because all the class societies, all the societies now in the world are class societies, there has to be a struggle among the elites. The predominant element of the elites in most countries is made of rentiers, especially financial rentiers, as well as rentiers off of land. There has to be a counter elite, which attempts to seize power and has a productivist and nationalist orientation, and which positions itself against these rentiers. And it is part then of the historical task of this counter elite to garner support in the popular majority, which is made up of this subjective petty bourgeoisie, and offer it an alternative to its dream. That is to say that there's another way of realizing what it wants, which is a modest prosperity and independence, which is not just attachment to archaic, isolated, retrograde family business, but engagement in this project, which then would be the popular form of the knowledge economy. And this lift-up operation, which the state uses its instruments to lift up the economic periphery of the small and medium-sized firms and of the individualized economic agent. That's the general character of this, of this story. But I think that the, the existence of this new constituency in the world of the subjective petty bourgeoisie is a hopeful phenomenon because despite the archaic character of their commitment in that abstract form that I described, uh, they have a desire, they have an ambition of agency. They want to be, they want to be dealt with as agents to be empowered and not as beneficiaries to be co-opted. And this whole agenda opens up then before us of these alternative forms of economic and social life. So this is a summary then, which I think, so there are two ideas in this class presentation I just made. One is a high energy democracy by contrast to the weak, low energy democracies that exist. And the second idea is the dialectical relation of a high energy democracy to the democratized market order. One presupposes the other or demands the other. So, what's your judgment? Yes. There's a huge problem of race in the United States, but, and we haven't discussed that uh, here. I've discussed that in another course on the United States, but I, I think in the American context, all of this is connected with a change in 
how the race problem is approached. You know, there have been basically four approaches to race in American history. There's been the accommodationist approach, collaborationist or accommodation. Booker T. Washington after the Civil War, in which the idea was the blacks will acquire, they, the blacks will have a subordinate niche in American society, in American economy. They'll be smallholders, small business, small business class I was just talking about. Huh? And I think this is paradoxical in the following way, that actually to achieve this seemingly modest objective of consolidating this niche would require a huge amount of political organization and pressure. It seems to be a modest objective but its actual achievement would be a vast task. And it seems to me completely implausible that this power could be evoked and created and then be satisfied with such a modest outcome. So either they don't have the power and they're not able to achieve that outcome that Booker T wanted, or they do have it, and then they won't be satisfied with just that outcome. So that's the first program. The second program was the secessionist program, you know, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, uh, which is literally leaving the United States in the first moment. Huh? But in practice, for the most part, the idea of secession from the United States turned out to be a feint because what replaced it was internal exile in the United States. And paradoxically, in a form which is very close to the Booker T idea because respectable petty bourgeois society in the black churches and so forth uh, occupying this niche. So even though it seems to be, the second seems to be the opposite of the first, they're, they're very close. Now then comes third, the integrationist orthodoxy, which I would call the threshold approach. Uh, race is separate from class. Uh, and you have to deal with it as an antecedent problem, separately from class. And, and that it leads to what happens in the United States. So it leads to programs like affirmative action. So, so look at affirmative action as an example of the racial orthodoxy in the United States. What does it do? First, it generates benefits that are in inverse proportion to the need for them. So it benefits the black professional bourgeoisie, the black business and professional class, most. Secondarily, it benefits the black working class in public employment, like policemen and firemen. Whom it doesn't benefit at all is the mass of poor blacks who are in the secondary labor market and filling the American prisons. They're totally abandoned uh, by, this, by this program. So then there would be the fourth approach, which was the one briefly tried out and suppressed in the United States in the years immediately after the Civil War by the Freedmen's Bureau, which is to connect race and class. And that, uh, and that seems to me the necessary, uh, and preventing then what has happened in the United States that the white working the white working class called in the United States the middle class, which means simply in the American vocabulary what it means is a worker with a bourgeois identity. Huh? So the white working class feels abandoned and feels the victim of a conspiracy between the white and black leaderships, huh? and that's background in these traumatic events in American politics. The progressives have no sequel to Franklin Roosevelt's program. So part of the establishment of an American alternative is a different approach to the race problem. Uh, to me, the essence of the different approach is a radical distinction between individualized discrimination and structural advancement. Individualized discrimination should be penalized. As in many countries, individualized discrimination should be a crime. 
sanctioned as a crime. But the collective promotion of the disadvantage has to be based on real disadvantage. And real disadvantage in a class society is almost always primarily class, class first, and all the other circumstances is aggravations of class, like race. Huh? So that's a total revolution in the American approach to class. So the connection of that to this kind of argument we're having here is that I'm speaking about the progressive alternative universally, globally, as I said. I don't believe that a universal orthodoxy as social democracy or social liberalism is can be effectively combated by a set of local heresies. I think, as John Stuart Mill thought, and as Karl Marx thought in the 19th century, that a universal orthodoxy can be successfully combated only by a universalizing heresy. And what I'm trying to describe here in this course are the elements of this universalizing heresy. It's not for this or that country, it's for humanity. Uh, but in each country, it has to face particular problems. And in the United States, I just gave an example of the, of the particular problem of race. And if, if, the, if the logic of the universalizing heresy is to be implemented in the American circumstance, it has to be combined with the struggle and the overcoming of the American anomalies, like, like this attitude to race. Otherwise, it can't work. Nothing else? Yes. I wanted to ask you about um, what is the context of the diversion in the federalist model. So you said that the European Union should turn the paradigm so that the social would be. Well, for example, for, for example, how to organize an inclusive knowledge economy. Uh, you know, now, for example, now in the United States, you know that almost all of the Republican governors are trying to have their own little industrial policy. Uh, and most of them are trying to establish their little local Silicon Valleys. And it's, so it's a fiasco because they imagine like a little, uh, a midget version of Silicon Valley, right? It's a Potemkin village. Uh, it's a facade. Uh, as if by having an industrial park or a set of buildings, they could invoke, they could evoke that economic reality. So it's, it's, it can't work. But what I think is that the failure of those Potemkin villages is then a presage to something that could be serious, which is this, this project that we've been discussing of the lift up that has an antecedent earlier in American history, in the organization in the early 19th century of entrepreneurial agriculture with, of family scale agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes, which was based on this lift up. Exactly. They, they, what the Americans did with agriculture in the 19th century is they didn't just regulate it. They didn't just uh, attenuate the inequalities generated in the agricultural market. They organized a form of agriculture that had never existed in the world before on the basis of uh, strategic coordination between the government and the family farmer and cooperative competition among the family farmers. That was the invention of a new kind of market. And that's precisely the kind of thing we're discussing in relation to the, to the contemporary knowledge economy. So that, that's what I imagine as, as, so when you ask what's the topic of the divergence, it's stuff like that in political economy. Because I think that the political and constitutional innovation <coughs> has to be driven by a struggle over the social and economic direction. to be changed, right? Yes. So the architectural, and we discussed this before, the architectural principle of the union is 
the power to define the basic regimes of social and economic organization is centralized, and the power to, to attribute educational and social endowments is delegated to the national and subnational authorities. Has to be the opposite. The principle has to be reversed, which you say the vocation of the union is to secure the endowments, the equipment of all of its citizens, but then to give them the greatest latitude possible for institutional experimentation. And how would this happen in the union? It could only happen if the southern and eastern European countries allied with the oppositional forces within Germany and France to force it, a change in the direction of the union. Because otherwise, you know, an, an Eastern European country is going to be treated like a third world country. And there would be some subaltern niche in the European division of labor. Uh, so take, take the debate in Greece. In Greece, instead of complaining about the Germans, the Greeks should be deciding what they're going to do in the world and what their, what their place in the, in the world division of labor. We'll continue after the break. Have a good break. <laughs>